My name is Paul Hacker. I'm a solution architect with a company called Agile Thought based out of Tampa, Florida. I'm based out of Indianapolis. And today we're going to talk about um, what's new in build automation in VSTS 2015. So before we get started, here's my contact information. I tend to talk fast. And if you miss anything, don't worry. I have um, a link to my OneDrive site that I can push out on Twitter. Um, and I'll hashtag it LR TechFest or whatever their hashtag is. Um, I have these sessions all recorded already, um, so you can actually download and re you know, replay them. They're recording them here, too, so um, you'll, you'll get the content. Uh, my Twitter is at PJHacker. My blog is PaulHacker.net. So we're going to talk about why. And the why is, why did Microsoft go back and recreate Visual Studio T uh, Team Build 2015? Why did, they stay, why did they abandon what they were doing in 2010 and 2012 and 2013? Um, some of the common questions that are being asked. Um, we'll talk about the architecture of the tooling, and then we'll go into the extensibility parts and talk about some gaps, and then we'll demo it. Um, so we're not going to go super deep on the demo, but we are going to show you end-to-end -end build creation, builds running, things like that. So some of the questions that we were getting at Microsoft, or I should say Microsoft was getting, was, you know, um, how do I script a, and build a solution, uh, run a script after I build a solution? So uh, one of the things with the old version of build was it was uh, Windows Workflow, or what they call XAML builds. There was no real easy way to run PowerShell or command line or anything without going in and modifying this um, Windows Workflow, which was incredibly difficult to do. If you didn't know how to work with Windows Workflow, most people didn't extend the builds. So Microsoft decided we've got to get away from this whole XAML idea and come back to something that's a little more customizable. So that's what they, they, they did with this. We, it's all based on Windows PowerShell now. Uh, and then how do I integrate with these other apps? Uh, again, very difficult. How to do uh, Android or iOS builds? Well, obviously with build 2012 or 2010 to 2013, 12, um, there was no iOS builds, there was no Android builds. You had to build in this, this um, mechanism if you wanted to build. So Microsoft again went back and said, okay, we need to make this thing cross-platform. So and that's what they did. So now from the build, we can deploy, or build and deploy actually, to any platform out there. Uh, we can build iOS apps, we can build Android apps, and we can deploy those apps using Microsoft's release tools. And, um, and again, the other question was, why do I have to have Visual Studio installed on my machine to work with a build? I'm a build engineer. I don't want to work in Visual Studio. That's not the tool of choice for me. So again, Microsoft decided to come back to the drawing board and make it a web-based tool. Therefore, there's no need to install anything on your machine in order to work with uh, the build system today. Uh, again, some other questions were the build log. So there, there was no good way to get the build log unless you could get onto the build server into the drop location or the build log location and get those logs. So again, Microsoft decided, let's make this a downloadable zip file. So when the builds run, it zips it up, the logs up, and it makes them a downloadable zip file for you to then review the logs. What's even nicer is that actually as you run through the specific steps of your build, and there could be one-to-end steps, um, the, the logs are broke down into each step. So you don't have to, you know, transverse a, a, a huge log file, but you can go to each step and see what was going on at that particular step. Um, and then again, the XAML, whole thing about XAML, if you've ever looked at a XAML file or you ever looked at Windows Workflow, you'll know that it's just a mess. Um, keeping agents up to date. Again, it wasn't very easy. Now it's as simple as right-click, update agents, and all the agents get updated on your machines. Uh, and then why do binaries get dumped to a single folder? So this is a, this is a big deal. Not everybody wants all their binaries dumped to one folder. Okay, that's how Microsoft originally had set up the tooling was everybody gets their binaries just dumped out after a build into the drop location that you specify. So Microsoft decided this isn't going to work, especially in the cloud world, because there's no way you can access your binaries in the cloud. So what they did was they decided in the cloud they were going to push them into TFS and let you download them as a, um, as a zip file or that way. Or you could d dictate which files go into staging, which files go into a drop, and you could, and you could set up um, your binaries to go to different locations, both locally and, again, or in the cloud. So team build's dead, but long live team build. It's been just redone. It's been reborn. It's um, all 
been rebuilt from the ground up, so there is no more traces of XAML, but the old bills are called XAML bills. And TFS 2015, or VSTS, I should say, offers uh, the ability for you to run your XAML builds from the 2015 interface. So if you have bills built um, already from prior versions, they will show up in your build list in 2015. The only thing is, is you can run them from the 2015 interface, but you can't do anything with them. You can't edit them in 2015. If it's a 2013 build, for example, it'll show up in the interface. You can run it, but you must have a 2013 build server to run it against. You can't run prior XAML builds against a 2015 build agent. So again, you have, there's a lot of work that has to go into making sure that you know, everything works with my prior bills. The point is, is that you can run them from the 2015 interface and watch them, their output. So like we talked about, there's no more XAML. It's completely cross-platform. It's a task-based PowerShell built system that's completely open sourced. So anything you can do in VSTS TFS 2015 build, uh, you, can, you can think of it, you can write PowerShell to do it if somebody hasn't already written PowerShell to do it. Take a couple, I was just talking to Paul beforehand here, and he was telling me how he took the pieces of a couple different build tasks and created his own custom build task. Again, it's just PowerShell. If you understand PowerShell, you can create these, and again, it's all open source on GitHub. So some of the architectural changes, um, there is no more controller. So in prior versions of, of build, you actually had to set up a controller and associate that controller with a, a specific uh, TFS uh, collection. So it was a one-to-one -one relationship. Any project in the collection could use that particular build controller, but if you had multiple collections, you had to stand up multiple build servers because each, each one had, a, had to be associated with a particular collection. So they got away from all that and they, they, they went to this idea of pools, pools and queues. So you can have an agent pool and you can have n number of agents in your pool. Um, the idea is, is that you can now mix and match your pools and your agents across um, different project collections, different projects, whatever the case may be. There's no more one-to-one -one relationships anywhere. Um, and the agents get updated automatically via an X copy. So you just right click on an agent and we'll show you how to do all that. Um, and just say update the agents and everything gets updated to the latest version. So again, if we look at how that architecture looks, um, you can see here we have uh, our TFS deployment. We have a couple of pools, and you can see we have some machines out here as our agent machines. And you can see we have um, you know, agent one, pool one, agent one, pool two, all on the same machine. So everything can be you know, crossed uh, amongst each other, and there is no more worrying about that, like I said, that one-to-one -one relationship. The idea here is that for every build machine you have, you should be able to have one agent per core on that machine. Four core machine, four agents. Six core machines, six agents. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, improved security. So again, security around the builds was not really uh, thought of in the earlier versions. While you could do it, it just wasn't as, as good. Um, so what they did is they uh, decided they were going to do this uh, whole um, security change and now you can actually manage who can access bills, who can run the bills, um, what permissions people have with certain bills, so not everybody can go out there and just start kicking off bills randomly. From the extensibility point of view, um, you just add tasks. Like I said, it's PowerShell. Uh, you just, if you understand PowerShell, you can create your own tasks. And again, custom tasks. So there's some gaps um, between the latest version and what previously was out there. One of the things, it, depending on the version you're running, and again, I marked them up here, if you're running, let's say, 2015.1 or earlier, um, you're not going to get gated builds. Gated builds are a pre-check-in build. Uh, and um, if you're not familiar with it, it's the ability for you to, to check in your code. Um, it puts it up on my, in, in, in a, a TFS shelf set. It takes the code that's in version control, brings it down, compiles it on that shelf, and then once it's compiled, it pushes it into version control. So you, the idea is you don't check in a broken build. So that's only available in TFS 2015.2 and later, update two and later. Um, labeling and tagging of sources, again, update one. Uh, Client-side workspace mapping, update one. And, and then the build chaining is also uh, not there yet. Neither is the throttling. But they are getting there, and we're on update uh, four now, update five possibly. 
So things have moved along pretty good. Also, just so you understand the cadence at Microsoft, if you're using the cloud version, um, you're updated every three weeks with new functionality, bug fixes, whatever. Uh, in, in, on premises, you're updated every three months um, with all the cumulative updates from the three week periods uh, prior to that. So with that, let's switch over and look at VSTS. Okay, I'm using the cloud version, but everything I showed today is available on premises too. So I'm not going to go into anything that's not going to be available for you either way, however you, you work with TFS. I'm working with a project called Mercury Health, and uh, it's a nutrition exercise tracking application. Uh, this is the home page for the team. It's um, basically your, your dashboard for all the things you want to you wanna keep track of. Uh, you can see you can create multiple dashboards. So here I kind of have a DevOps dashboard, and that tracks um, builds and releases uh, for my application. You can see these are real live tiles. I can click on any one of these and dive into the details. Here I can see what's going on with my current releases. Uh, what I care about is the builds, so we're going to go over here to builds. And we're just going to take a look at um, creating a new build. Uh, but before we can create a new build, the first thing we have to do is set up our agents. And what I do is I go into this little gear up here, and I go into agent queues. And this is where I can set up a new pool to contain my agents. So you get this hosted pool out of the gate, OK? And um, it's, it's it, when you're working with the cloud. Uh, and it's just a single agent that's available to you. Uh, if you work in the cloud, you're going to have to buy more agents beyond the one. So you, you buy agents as you need them. And I, you can think you buy them in packs of four or something like that. I'm, I'm not really sure because I haven't bought them in a while. But um, I'm not sure even on the pricing of it. It's all changed in a little bit. But that's how you'd add more agents if you were in the cloud. I have a Mac pool here. So you can see I have a few agents in my Mac pool, one of them which is currently online. So this is where I run my iOS um, apps. Uh, now. When I'm, the one that's currently online is a service called Mac in the Cloud. So if you've never heard of Mac in the Cloud, it costs me about 30 bucks a month, and I can integrate it with VSTS, and I can run all my iOS app builds um, through that Mac in the Cloud service, and I never have to worry about having a physical Mac machine to have to build this thing on. So it's really nice. I don't have to carry a Mac with me everywhere I go anymore. Uh, we also have other ones that I've created here. We're working with Jenkins, so I have a Jenkins server and an agent for that. Um, and you can create other, um, other pools if you want just by clicking on manage pools here and adding a new pool in. It's pretty straightforward, you know, just come in here, cl click new pool, give it a name, you know, well, let's call this one Little Rock Tech Fest, looks good. And, and now I got a pool. The next thing I do is download the agent. When we download the agent, it's going to download a zip file for you. It's going to give you a couple of options. They have the Windows, OS X, Linux, and Windows Legacy. Don't use Windows Legacy. It's, been, it's going to be deprecated. It's, it's just it's not as compatible with, with some of the, the tasks and things that are working in build right now. So they've, they've created the new one called Windows. So if you're doing Windows, you're on a Windows build server, use that. Again, OS X or Linux, you can use um, those particular agents. And you can pick your flavor of Linux. Um, and uh, OS X is, is 10.11. Once you download this agent, it's going to basically give you a folder, and you're going to right-click on the command file, say, run as, run as administrator, otherwise it won't run. It's going to ask you a bunch of questions about your project. I would download it, but it's going to take a little bit here on, on this wireless. Uh, it's going to ask you things like, what's the agent name? What's the pool name? You know, where, where do I want to run this as a Windows service or interactive? So you have to kind of consider those things and then just give it the information, and that agent's basically stood up on the machine. Agents can stand up on a 2013 or 2012 or 2010 build box. They all work side by side. So you don't, if you have hardware already for a build server, you don't have to buy new hardware. You can just currently use what you have and then just install the agent. Um, the other thing is you have to make a decision on what the agents is. Do you want to run them in interactive mode or in, in um, a Windows service mode? If you're running coded UI tests, you have to run them in an interactive mode, which means they basically always are running in a command prompt on that build server. The build server goes down, your agent goes down. When it comes back up, you need to turn your agent back on in interactive mode again. 
as a build service, it's a little more resilient because the service goes down when the machine goes down, but it comes back up when the machine comes back online. So just, just remember that. Once I have my agent in place, and it looks something like this, I can then um, go into some of the roles that um, my agent plays. Here, here's the roles. I can add more roles to it. Uh, you don't really have to mess in here too much. Let's go back to agent pools again. And you can see here we have requests and capabilities. Capabilities are the ability to tell the agents telling you what am I capable of doing on this particular server. So can I can I run you know .NET applications? Here you can see we're running we're running Grunt and Gulp and some Java JDKs and JREs and all the information that I'm available for you to be able to take place on that particular server. So once I have that set up, I can go back to the builds uh, here. Actually, let's do it this way. And now I can go about creating a new build. So I have my agent. I'm ready to go. I click on the new. It's going to ask me a couple of questions like, what type of uh, template do you want to use here? You can start out with an empty, te empty template. No tasks are in it, no steps, no nothing. You just build it as you need it. You also have other options here, such as like maybe a Maven or a Visual Studio or iOS, Xcode. Um, I'm going to start off with a Visual Studio build because I'm building a Windows app. And then it's going to ask me about the uh, repository that I'm going to work from. So I'm currently using Git as my back end here. I'm not using TFS version control. So there's some limitations with that, and we'll talk about some of those as we run into them. Uh, I'm going to use the Mercury Health Repository. I'm going to use Release One Branch. Um, it lets me decide, do I want to make this continuous integration, or do I want to uh, make this just a manual build? A continuous integration basically means when anybody checks into Release One, this build's going to kick off. It's going to run. Uh, what, again, here, what agent queue do we want to use? You can see we have some options. I'm going to stay with the hosted. This creates the skeleton for me of the basic build. And you can see it's added some steps to there. So it, it, the templates are nice if I know what I'm going to be building because it adds a few things for me. I don't have to do everything from scratch. Um, the first thing we're going to do is restore the NuGet packages. Then we're going to build the solution. We're going to run some tests. And we're going to package this thing up and push it out to a drop location. If this is truly a continuous integration build, though, I don't need half of these steps. Because in a continuous integration build, it's small, it's lightweight, it's fast. I don't need to package things in a continuous integration build um, because I'm, all I'm doing is just building it to make sure I can get it into version control and it, and it builds successfully. So what I would do is I would go in here and remove these packaging and drop location tasks and just keep this um, as these three steps. And then I could go into the NuGet restore step, for example. I could point it to my repository here and tell it I want to use that solution um, and I wanted to go into the build and do the exact same thing. And again, I can tell it what platform and configuration. When you see items like this with a dollar sign paren name paren, that's a variable. And we can set variables in the variables tab up here, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, basically, the platform is, uh, you know, do I want it to be um, uh, OSX or, I mean, um, uh, x64, x86, things like that. And the configuration is like any CPU or, uh, again, um, things like that. So you can set those in the variables. Or you can set them here hard-coded. Um, what version of Visual Studio am I running against? Again, you can run against other versions of Visual Studio if you want. And then tests. People go back and forth on tests in a continuous integration build because, again, it's lightweight. It should be ran and checked in um, as quickly as possible. I personally like to run priority one tests, or unit tests, that is, uh, when I do my continuous integration builds. That's usually a subset of my unit tests. Uh, but they're important unit tests that need to be run every time I do a, a check-in. So what I can do is I can actually tell it in this criteria here, is I can type in test, um, test category, and I can make it to equal unit tests. And let's call them P1. 
So in my Visual Studio application, when I create tests, I have the ability to categorize those tests. And I'm going to put that category as unit tests P1, my priority one unit tests. What this, what this step will do is it will look at anything with the name test in the DLL, in the assembly name. And if it finds one, it's going to interrogate it for test methods. And if it finds test methods, it's going to interrogate it to see if they match the category we're looking for. If they do, it'll run those tests. So the solution I'm working with has load tests, web tests, unit tests, selenium tests, and all that. I don't want to run all those, so I just want to run the P1 tests. Um, at that point, I could actually save this off as, um, and we'll do .ci here because we want to do a CI build. And we can save it. The other options we have are do we want to do a multi-configuration? So one of the nice things about uh, TFS 2015 is I have the ability to run these in parallel. So if I have multiple builds and multiple agents, I can run them all in parallel if I tell it to. These multipliers are things like debug, release, QA, um, whatever, whatever type of build you want to run. So most people are running a release build or a debug build. You could put in here debug, comma, release. And if I have two agents and I can tell it to run in parallel, it will actually run the debug and the release in parallel together. So I don't have to wait for one to run for the other one to run. I only have one agent in the hosted, so we're just going to leave that there. Create work items on failure. Um, by default, uh, all prior versions created, a, created a, a work item if the build failed. Filled up your TFS system with all these defects or bugs. Um, we don't want that, so they basically turned it off. But again, I could turn it back on. I can even tell it what type of item do I want to create. Um, and then this allowing the scripts to access OAuth tokens. So you can use OAuth tokens in the build rather than using username and passwords, which is the preferred mechanism. And you can create a token just by going up to your name and going to profile or security, I mean. Uh, and here you can add personal access tokens. Yeah, they live for up to a year. So if I wanted to add, I could tell it, you know, what scope do I want this to work in? So maybe I just wanted to run um, in a build for read or build for write, things like that. I could select the scopes or I could use all scopes. I give it a description. I give it an expi expiration date of up to a year. And which account do I want to use? Once I have that in place, I'm ready to go. Um, repository we looked at already. We're basically using my Git repo of uh, Mercury Health for release one branch. Variables. Here's where we set up the variables. Um, we have the build configuration and the build platform, and we can add more. Um, so for example, let's say we want to write the uh, DB password in here, because we're going to use it in our build. I have the ability to lock these things, and I get to mask the, the, um, the value put in there. Um, this is transferred over to wire in 256-bit encryption. Um, it's pretty solid. I, I haven't broke it yet, I'm trying to do things through the API and program against it. Now, obviously, Microsoft has a way inside of to read it. And if obviously if you're smart enough and you work at it long enough, I'm sure somebody can come up with that secret, what they call the secret uh, value. Um, but it's not just as simple as let me write an API uh, script and, and pull it down. It doesn't work that way. So it's pretty secure. Um, whether or not you want to allow it at queue time when you queue the build, do you want to be able to set it then or just have it set here? Um, triggers, again, it can be a continuous integration or a scheduled. Now, I'm running later versions. Obviously, I'm on the cloud, so I'm running the latest version of VSTS. I should be able to run a gated check-in, you would think, except that I'm running in Git, and Git doesn't have gated check-ins. Only TF version control has gated check-ins. So if you're using Git, you're not going to take advantage of the pre-check-in build. You're going to take advantage of just the post-check-in continuous integration build. And we could set that here. And then you can see, do you want to batch these changes or not? Um, here's the branch we're using. Uh, again, here's the agent queue we're using. All this information's pretty well uh, been decided already. Here's the build number format. You can change your build number, use any kind of format you want for your build number. Demands. 
you can demand that this server do specific things. So for example, if I'm building um, SharePoint applications, for example, uh, I'm going to need to make sure there's certain bits on the build, ma build machine in order for this agent to be able to build those um, SharePoint uh, projects. So you can add a demand in here that basically says these things need to exist on the machine. And by that, I mean you go in here and you would type in, you know, the name of whatever it is you need. Uh, Azure PowerShell, for example, it would be AZ um, PowerShell or something like that, AZ PWRS, um, and make sure it exists. If it doesn't exist and you're trying to run your build, it will actually stop the build before it even takes off and say you don't meet the demands of this particular server. So in this case, when I put in the Azure PowerShell demand, um, if I try to run an, a, a build that has Azure PowerShell step in it, it won't actually work unless this demand is met on the server. And that also means not just typing the demand in here, but making sure the server has the Azure SDK already installed on it to be able to run this particular step. Retention, how long do you want to retain builds for? History. This is really nice. The history is, um, I get to be able to version these templates, which has never been able to be do done in other versions of the build system. Basically, in prior versions, somebody would go in, they'd make changes to your build template. You wouldn't know why, you wouldn't know um, what they were thinking, there would be no comments, no dates, no times, and if they didn't have, if they had the permissions, they could just go in and change it at will. So what they've done here is now between the security and between the auditing that's available in, in the versioning part here, we can see who made the change, when they made the change, and if they were nice enough to leave a comment, why they made the change. Uh, once you have multiple changes in place, you can actually diff the templates now. So because it's just pure JSON in the back end, uh, we can diff these and it'll show me um, real quickly what's the differences between this particular build. So there you can see we added a trigger. Uh, we go down here. We went from uh, undefined to false on the clean. Here we changed the revision number. So again, it's really easy to see what's been changed here. We added the password value and the uh, demand. Any questions on any of that? Okay, um, so now that I got a build, I can actually run them, but I'm going to go back and, and talk a little bit about a build I already have in place. Uh, let's go to the CD build. I have a CI and a CD, continuous delivery and a continuous integration build. I wanna talk about this one here for a second because it goes a little more in depth. It's not just a simple build. Uh, and, and I like to talk about it a little bit. So here we have our Mercury Health application. Uh, we have our NuGet restore, we have our build. But you can see in my build arguments, I've actually told it, I want you to package this thing up. I want you to basically um, package it, package it as a single file, which is gonna be a zip file. And I want you to drop it into this package location of staging, uh, the staging directory, which is the build.staging directory. That's important if you're going to use the release management tooling that's available for Microsoft to release this thing. If you decide to release the application, you're going to have to tell the release engine where to pick up its package from. And therefore, knowing a good common location, which in this case is a build.staging directory, it's a good known path, um, it'll be able to find it. So again, using this as, as a um, as good known path, whether it be build.staging or build.artifact staging, um, the release management will be able to find it. Again, we run our tests. This test I'm using is just plain unit test because I have a lot of tests in my particular project. And then we just package this thing up. Copy the files to the, store, store, to the um, sources directory and then drop it to the server. If I'm on-prem, I can drop it to a file share and give it a UNC path as long as it's an accessible UNC path. We're good to go. Here I'm doing the cloud so I don't have that functionality available to me. And so at this point now, I, there's a couple things I can do. This is a continuous delivery, which basically means every time something gets checked into my release branch, this, this build will kick off and try to do a release, an actual release. Um, for this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and queue a new build to get you shown in how this thing actually works. So we're gonna use the hosted queue, release one. System.debug is false. What that basically means is, um, 
do I want verbose output logging um, when I run my build? Uh, de the debug logging is turned off by default, but if I run into an error, I may choose to change this to true and rerun the build because it'll give me a very verbose output um, and help me you know, pinpoint the error that I'm running into possibly. So we'll just run that real quick. And it takes a minute to kick off. Oh, it failed. Why'd you fail? Hmm, let's go look. <laughs> I'm out of build minutes. <laughs> Great, Microsoft, thank you. So let's talk about a build then. That really is not good. Um, so we basically would run through it and it would do these steps. It would initialize an agent, it would get the sources, it would do the NuGet restore for us. Again, these logs are per step. It would build the solution. It would run the test assemblies for us, running the tests and telling us whether or not they've passed, failed, whatever. And then it would publish it out. Uh, when we get it um, to the end, we can go back to the particular uh, here, this, the, the, the dashboard, uh, their summary of basically what was done. And you can see here that, um, you know, we ran some tests, none failed, 14 passed, we got some code coverage out of it. Um, and then we got any deployments that were associated with it. So down here you can see I have a dev deployment, a QA prod environment, it's not deployed to yet, so there's a pending dev deployment. Also here you have associated work items and changes. So what that means is if you're using the, build tr the um, work item tracking system in TFS and you associate your check-ins to particular work items you're working on, when the build runs, it will look at everything that's changed since the prior build and will list out here all the work items you worked on, all the defects, all the features, all that, and it will associate all the changes that were, were checked in. So in, in Git, their commits and TFVC, their uh, change sets, and it would list them all out and you'd be able to dive into them. Uh, and, and go back actually from the build all the way down to the line of code that was changed for that particular build. So the traceability is really nice. Uh, I really can't believe that I'm out of build minutes. So let's go over to iOS if nobody's got questions. And I know I'm out of build minutes there. And we're going to uh, look at our demo that we have for iOS. So I have an Xcode build. I just added a blank empty template. I added a build step for Xcode. I can add other build steps if I wanted to. You can see here I can add um, utility steps such as uh, copy files, run PowerShell, um, whatever the case may be. Um, testing, packaging, and deploying. Most of the deploys are Azure-based deployments. It's, it's the assumption that you want to go to Azure with this when you deploy, um, but that's not always the correct assumption. In Xcode, we do a couple of different things. We don't work with solutions in Xcode. We work with um, the projects, so we have the ability here to give it an action. Actions are usually things like build, clean, analyze, things like that. So what I'm telling this Xcode build to do is to build it. Again, I have a configuration and an SDK to use. SDKs are things like iPhone simulator, iPad simulator, things like that. Um, if I go over to the variables, which again, a lot of the same options, you can see here I'm using the iPhone simulator in a debug and release build. So at this point, I'm just gonna queue a new build because everything else is pretty much the same as it would be in, in a TF um, VC build, Visual Studio build. I'm gonna use, use the Mac pool here. And so this is running against Mac in the cloud. So it's gonna go out to the Mac in the cloud service. It's gonna pick an agent, a Mac agent, and it's going to go ahead and uh, build against that. So you can see it's going out there, it's getting the sources, and I can click on any one of these steps and it'll give me the output for that particular step. So right now it's just running. No questions? It's early. So there it goes, it's got the workspace now. And you can see here we can click on 
still getting the sources. So while that's running, oh, there it goes. I was going to say we'd go back and look at something else. but So now it's starting the actual build itself. And again, if I'm using the release management tooling, I could actually release this thing out to the App Store. And finishing up the build, and everything looks like it's done on the debug side. Now it'll go into the release side because I don't have more than one agent. And it'll run the exact same thing, but in release mode. So while that's doing that, let's go back to my Mercury Health. Let's see, I can't create a build yet. Let me try and just do one more, just in case. I can't believe I'm out of minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of minutes. I'm out of minutes for the month, man. Sorry about that, folks, I didn't realize it. I was doing my demos last night just fine. Um, here, though, I can go back into the, the source version, so I can actually go back into the commit from the summary and see what was actually worked on um, in here. So I can see um, I changed an instrumentation key for my application insights. So App Insights is a monitoring tool for Azure applications. And um, basically, um, I set up my application to be monitored when it gets deployed to Azure. And therefore, I had to change the uh, instrumentation key to make sure I was getting the correct um, uh, App Insights um, service picking it up. Uh, what's nice about this is that I can actually go into the, um, to the code uh, and find that particular change. And I can even make edits in the browser so I don't have to um, open up Visual Studio, say I want to change that instrumentation code again. I could go into the uh, Mercury Health application and code, change it again and check it in. So if I go to the web, it's here somewhere, there it is. I could edit it here. I could change that code to be something else. Save it and it will check it in and actually kick off a particular build. It's really nice. Now it's not for you to develop in obviously, but it's for making small config changes and things like that, it's great. Let's go back to our iOS build again real quick and see how that looks, if it's all done yet. And it looks like it succeeded. Yep. So I can click on it and just go in there and see that everything ran successfully. Well, obviously, we're not running any tests or anything. We were just doing a compilation. Uh, but you can see that everything successfully built the iOS application for us. So that's, that's really nice. I, um, I'm really impressed with what we can do um, cross-platform with the build system. So, um, well, I wish I had about 10 more minutes because I wanted to talk to you about the uh, builds, but obviously I can't run a build, so we're going to finish a little early, I guess. Uh, let me go to here. Any questions on anything? I, we covered a lot of ground. Obviously, I can't run a particular build for Windows, but we could run it for iOS. Um, any other questions? Anybody have questions? Anything? No? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but okay, so that's that's a good question. I set up a release with my build, and I do my coded UI after I do the release, and and I'm, and I'm using Microsoft's release tooling to do that. Now, if all you're going to do is a build. It's going to have to exist on a server somewhere to do the coded UI, right? So let's say we are using the release. I will go into the releases tab and, and, and basically tell the release, I want you to run tests of coded UI type category on the particular instance once it gets deployed. So uh, let's go in and edit this one real quick, and I'll show you that. So I have a release here. 
Um, I'm going to dev, and you can see I have test assemblies here. Here I'm running unit tests. I could very easily tell it after it's deployed, because basically what this is doing is it's taking and standing up an Azure environment with, our, with ARM. It's then deploying to Azure, and then it's saying, I'm telling it here, run the unit test against that Azure instance. I could very easily say, you my coded UI tests against that Azure instance, and it would run my coded UI tests. Now again, the agent has to run in interactive mode, which means that command prompt has to be up on the build server and it has to be all working and everything for it to run coded UI tests. But that's how I would do it if I was in this scenario. Yep. Any other questions? If not, folks, I think we're gonna be done a little early. It's only quarter after, but um, I really appreciate you coming. I'm really sorry about running out of build minutes. That, that really kind of hit me by surprise. Um, but again, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to stop by and ask me.